called acute coronary syndrome, ACS, acute coronary syndrome, which in plain English essentially refers to unstable angina or You'll see that listed on charts is USA, unstable angina, SA is stable angina, but acute coronary syndrome is referring to unstable angina or infarction has occurred. Uh, the lay people call this heart attack, okay, heart attack. <clears throat> To you, it's myocardial infarct, okay? So, why does this occur? Well, you can probably guess. Um, you know, we're supposed to exercise, we're supposed to quit smoking, we're supposed to eat healthy, and, you know, who wants to do that? So, um, then came the revolution of statins. It's like, okay, now we can take a pill to help lower our chance of what is referred to as plaque formation. Okay, that stuff gets in those vessels and the platelets will start adhering and for you know it, that uh, area of the vessel, the blood can't go through. Okay. Um, and that is when your patient, you know, they could have had some symptoms uh, before. Uh, maybe they went from, you know, mowing the yard and having some symptoms to now sitting at rest and having symptoms um, before when they sat down it went away and now it's not going away and that is because again that vessel now has so much plaque build up that the blood flow cannot go through and so now they're in trouble okay um, this patient should definitely get your immediate attention um, why? You know that we want to prevent necrosis to the myocardium, okay? We want to prevent an infarct because that cannot be reversed, okay? We, at this point in time, do not have the ability to reverse that. So what we're trying to do is capture this patient, get them into the hospital, okay? Go ahead and get, of course, your history physical, y'all know that. But we want to go ahead and get EKG. We're going to slap oxygen. Remember, you should remember this as Mona, but again, it's just a mnemonic, but certainly oxygen is a priority. Um, somebody else is going to get the EKG, you know, aspirin, etc. okay? Why is this so important? Um, oh, and I should also say, we now have bedside troponin. A lot of the EDs have bedside troponin. So we need that immediate feedback that this is truly unstable angina or you know, the infarct is going to occur or has occurred, okay? Hopefully we've caught this in time. Um, why is that so important, okay? Our goal is that from this time to this time is 30 minutes. Okay. We actually want to administer a drug, <coughs> tissue plasminogen activator. A lot of you remember um, retoplase is another one. But your thrombolytics can actually be given and help open up that vessel and prevent that necrosis to the muscle. So that's our goal. Because we know if we can just somehow get that vessel open, 
to get blood flow through, then we could prevent that dead tissue or infarction, okay? So that is our goal. Now, let's say on my EKG, I'm looking at this, and again, you can see, help me, okay? On the EKG, you can actually have what is called ST segment elevation or non-ST segment elevation. They're both series. Okay? So they're both series. Now, that is why this revolution of this lab becomes critical. Like I said, that's why we now have bedside troponin to help identify what is going on with this patient and get them to where they need to be. Okay? What does this actually mean? Okay, now I could just sit here and say, well, you know, it's just steamy or non-steamy. Well, that tells you nothing, okay? What that means is when you look at the normal EKG, you can see you've got your PQRS. See how this comes right back? We call that baseline. That is actually referring to what is called an isoelectric line. What does that mean in plain English? The ions, those electrolytes, are in proper position and the levels are normal. And we've not got, you know, occlusion issues going on. So because that is what causes this to come back to what is called baseline. So the heart gets ready for the next beat. Now when we have occlusion issues, and I'm talking severe, 70, 80, 90, 100, 100 percent is not good, um, occlusion because some students are like, well, how do you know? Well, you don't know. I mean, that's why we go ahead and treat. Because until they get in the cath lab, I can't tell you if they've got 70%, 80%, or 100%. All I know is they've got significant blockage. Okay? And there's nothing I can do about that. Except try to identify what is going on with this patient. So this is getting my attention as well as this, okay? If I see what is called ST segment elevation, my S is not going back to baseline. This is actually, and this is just FYI, this point right here, where it returns to baseline, the heart is feeling, this is called the J point, right there. For those of you who have an interest, it's called the J point. Okay, so this is what you want to see. It comes right back to baseline, the heart is feeling, and it's just getting ready for its next bit. No, you know, no nonsense. Now, when you see this on the EKG, well, that ain't going back to baseline. Okay, well, that's the myocardium basically saying, I'm dying. I'm dying. Do you hear me? So, this would get my palms sweaty. You know, going, I need IV nitroglycerin, I need IV heparin, so many things right there. Okay. Also, with my history, it's very important. Unfortunately, there are contraindications to this. There are few, few of them. Hemorrhagic stroke. Stroke within the last three months that you may have gotten thrombolytics then. Uncontrolled hypertension. Major trauma. So there's very few, but there are contraindications. We can't put, unfortunately, that patient at risk 
before thrombolytic therapy and then have them bleed out in the brain. Okay? So, I know some of you are saying, well, what are you going to do? Are you just going to let them infarct? No, 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 no. I'm going to say, get them to the cath lab now because of this history. Somebody needs to go in there, interventional cardiologist. They're going to go in through the right or left groin, and they are actually going to take a balloon. It actually looks very similar to a balloon when it opens. And they're going to open up this vessel with this balloon. Okay, now FYI, that's very easy to do now with these proximal lesions. Proximal men, they're high, right? These long, high lesions, okay? This is called percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. Okay, PTCA, percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. So they're going to go in there with this balloon and open that stuff up. Okay? And I know some of you are saying, well, couldn't they throw something? Heck yeah, they could. Um, when I remember when they first started doing these, okay, and what would happen, guys, is they would open this up, and what would happen? The vessel would close. Within three months, that dang vessel would just close back up, okay? In particular, you may say, well, why? Again, we don't want to exercise, we don't want to change our diet, and we don't want to quit smoking. Okay, to name few. So it would close right back. So they then came up with this neat little tool. And you guys probably don't even remember. Some of you do. You remember the old days when the pens had that little wire thing? Some of you? That's it, about exactly what that looked like. And that's a stent. Okay, they invented this little coil thing. And this was called a stent. Now, to let you know, when they first started doing stents, it was a joke. Because the dudes in there didn't have the technique down. So they would rupture something, and they would end up with me in the unit with bypass surgery. So for the longest time, it seems like everybody was having major problems. Now, once they perfected it, it became a very popular and actually a great benefit to avoid coronary bypass surgery, okay? So now, you've got people walking around with four and five of these little things in their coronary vessels. They keep, they'll just go and have the stents put in. These stents now have what is called drug eluding material. It's called DES, drug eluding material. It actually has material on the stent that prevents platelets from adhering to this little wire thing. Okay? Now, also, these patients have to be on what is called glycoprotein 2s. They're called Reapro and Integralin or hold on, Integralin, sorry. There are two that are now out there. There are others. But what these do is prevent because that's the goal. Okay, is to prevent any platelet adherence to that pole. Okay, that is our goal, to prevent that. So initially they'll come out on these blood protein 2 inhibitors, Reapro or Integralin, and then eventually that patient is going to be on like Plavix, maybe aspirin, etc. Again, to prevent 
platelet adherence to this stent. And we've had great success now with that. Do you know anybody with stents? Mm -hmm. They doing fine? Yeah, you got people walking around with four or five stents. Okay, so it's been a great intervention. It was not initially, it was a nightmare. So by using the balloon, and then we're going to put this coil in that coronary vessel, we're going to give them meds to prevent platelet aggregation, and you can see nice blood flow, no dead tissue. So those have been two interventions that have made huge pro pro progress in this country. In fact, they even look at stats on the emergency department's time to get these people with getting them assessed, thrombolytic therapy, or PTCA with stem. Okay? So in fact, with this, it's like they want no more than 90 minutes to protect that myocardium, okay? So that's what STEMI and non-STEMI mean, okay? This is serious. You can have, especially, remember I talked about your diabetics, your women, your women, their coronary vessels are smaller. I know that from working with the surgeons for umpteen thousand years. Their vessels are smaller still, you're waiting on those troponins and uh, treating their symptoms. Okay, very, very important. Trying to protect that myocardium from any increased workload. Yes. In the steaming, will the, uh, will the ST be elevated every beat and will it be regular or irregular? It can be irregular. Okay, will it be every beat though? Uh, probably. For until it's fixed? Or just yeah, I have actually seen, just to answer your question, when they administer the thrombolytic, I actually watched this go down and the patient had no muscle injury. Really? Yep. No muscle injury whatsoever. That's why time is critical. Time is critical. Okay. And it's unfortunate, but of course we do see a lot of infarcts that occur, or patients have had old infarcts. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. You've got from the time they enter into the ED, and you start this. Okay, you want to identify, yes, they're a candidate, and that needs to be within 30 minutes of their symptoms. Okay? okay? What's the level of Well, this is theoretically, they want the symptoms, they want you coming in to the facility in less than four to six hours. But you and I know time is muscle. You know, I would rather you get to the ED and somebody sends you back home, you know, oh, poor soul, you got GI issues, you know. Well, I don't care. You know, it's best to rule this out, especially if I know you've definitely got some cardiac disease. Okay? So, and you've got a lot of people out there, they won't go. I mean, they'll sit there and infart. Because, again, they're not having that crushing elephant on their chest. All they know is they hurt. So, again, it can, um, you want to get them treated. Because that is very, very important. Okay, so from the time of symptoms, within 90 minutes. From the time of symptoms, within 90 minutes. Like I said, I want you up in that cath lab. Okay? Somebody better be in there to get this opened up. Okay? They're actually, they're very amazing now. Did you guys go to cath lab? Mm -hmm. Some of you did? 
really cool to see them. Okay, so again, as a nurse, treating unstable angina that is not to be taken lightly, okay, at all. Really, no type of angina is to be taken lightly, but at least if they're stable, you know, the nitroglycerin's working, you know, something's working here. You know, we're sitting down, and you're like, okay, okay. But if they keep on complaining, this is to be taken very, very seriously. You get their history um, quickly. You're treating them. Somebody's going to get EKG. Somebody's getting labs. Um, and because we have got to move here. We have got to move. If they're a candidate, go ahead. Um, administer thrombolytic therapy, which can resolve this blockage, open it up, get that blood flow going. If they're not a candidate, then get them in there, open that uh, blockage up with the balloon, and let's put a stent in. Does that make sense? Okay. So now you understand why it's called non-STEMI and STEMI. Okay? They're serious. And how many of you work ED? Do you see a lot of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of it. Um, so it's very, very important because our number one goal is to prevent dead tissue. <laughs> Once you infarct, and guys, that's... If this is what happens, if you infarct... Okay, I can't tell you, you probably don't realize the significance of that, okay? When you infarct, this area of the myocardium is either hypokinetic, that's determined by cath lab, or akinetic. And when I read that this part of your heart is actually not moving, So you may say, well, won't all this compensate? The problem is it, what you'll develop what is called ventricular asynchrony. So instead of shh, shh, you've got this, you know, shh, 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 shh. So it's, it's asynchronous. And it's called ventricular remodeling. What are we doing about that nowadays? To be honest, they're actually going in and putting pacers to pace this, this, and this for better synchrony. Okay. Nursing implications. Okay, I just covered nursing implications here. You understand the seriousness of that. Okay. Nursing implications here. You're taking care of an infarct. Okay? It can be on the floor, it can be anywhere. They could have had more than one. Okay? High risk failure. Remember heart failure? Okay? So you're like, well, I got orders for D5.5 normal saline with 20 milli MEQs of potassium, uh, doc orders to run it at 120 an hour. Well, Dodo Nurse is going to throw them into heart failure. Okay? Because they cannot handle. Guys, you have to remember, with ventricular asynchrony, okay, what is that doing to your perfusion? It's going down the tubes. And like I said when we talked about failure, that is why you now know, well, that's why you're on an ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, digoxin, aspirin. You know, you take a couple of meds. Well, you got a good reason. Because you're at high risk. And diuretics. Right? 
And next week, I'm hoping I see... Oh, now I get it. What that decreased perfusion is doing to your kidneys. Okay, and you're going to get it. Because the impact that this has is huge. So, if you're running those fluids... You should bring that forth from the previous uh, course. You're going to start to have what? Crackles, edema, short of breath, cough, can't, you know, can't breathe, dyspnea. Well, you just throw on that patient into failure. So don't do that. You know, that's why you've got to know your patients. Like I said, if their blood pressure is remaining 95 to 100 systolic, and you go back and you look at your trends, and it's been 95 to 100 systolic, thinking nurse is going to say, give it. Give it and watch them. Right? If their heart rate is 65, 62, give it and watch them. Because we cannot allow them to not have something to help with perfusion, okay? So they're high risk for congestive heart failure, high risk, because the ventricles either move some or none, and you can't reverse it. Yes, ma'am, somebody had a question back there. Um, well, they're both serious. It's just some patients can have symptoms and be non stimmy In other words, this isn't occurring. You may have some other changes on the EKG. You know, you may have dysrhythmias, but you're not seeing the classic ST elevation. They're both serious. So you don't want to say one's no. This patient right here, your attention is on them. Okay? You don't leave them, you're treating them, and you're monitoring those symptoms. Sorry. Why would you need to know? Um, well, I mean, I don't want to confuse you, okay? Um, more patients that we see have stimmies, okay? Most of those have classic clinical manifestations, okay? But it can go either way, okay? And in fact, I can't remember um, if your book a bit different GH film, because to me it should not be. So basically, they're both very serious. Um, but they have complications. You can also, okay, let me, and I'm trying not to go into such detail. Okay, this would be your classic. Okay, with a non stemmy she's like, well, what, do you, what might you see? You're going, you can see what is called ST depression, and in particular, T-wave inversion. This is indicating high probable ischemia leading to infarct. Okay? So with non-STEMI, you still... See, and it's hard for me to stand here and say that, but I, I don't want you confused. Because you don't know how many female patients I have taken care of that had no... None. 
but from your theoretical standpoint and not confusing you, this would be, again, more of a classic where non stemmy you're more likely to see ST depression, T wave inversion. Does that help? We're going to change it out, right? Clinically, no change at all. We're talking about symptomatic right now. We're talking about symptomatic. You're asymptomatic sitting at home. Time bomb, wait. If you have disease, in particular, if you look at the heart, you've got disease down here, you've got some here, you've got some here. In other words, you have multi-vessel disease. And some of your lesions are posterior. They're down low. Okay. That is a patient, and that's confirmed by cat lab, obviously. Cat lab's going to determine that. Based on those findings and the symptoms that the patient is having, we'll determine if they go coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Okay, this is for your multi-vessel disease. Coronary artery bypass graft surgery, cabbage. Okay, so that's going to determine. We have a lot of our patients that, of course, want stent placement. But there are times when stent placement is not an option. Certainly, if you've got blockage here, you're going to the OR. That's all I'm going to say. You're going to have bypass. That left main is going to kill you. Okay? That's the one, remember I said, is a widow maker. So you're going to surgery regardless. I had a, was a young man, heart rate was like in the 50s, but um, his, he was an athlete and um, genetics. He started having severe pain. Fortunately, they got him to the hospital because he's healthy. And they did bypass graft. And what they do, guys, is this is your aorta. And they're either going to use a saphenous vein or you've got a mammary artery on the right and a mammary artery on the left. Usually they'll take one mammary, in this case they did, and they're going to pull that down. So they're going to take another vessel and feed that artery, this coronary artery, below the level of the blockage. Okay? So they're feeding that below the level of the blockage. And in fact, the surgeon came out to me and said, his, his talking about the, the coronary vessel that he used to, to pull down here, he said it was the size of your thumb. I mean, it was so big because he was in such good state. But I thought, how unfortunate, you know? And that's real... Um, there's a lot of psychosocial issues when you have somebody who does do everything right and then actually has to have bypass surgery. Okay, um, there's a little bit more I'm going to talk about with this, uh, more of the post-op stuff. If you have any questions about this or, you know, you're just interested in it, this was my baby for 15 years. I worked here parts. So, we need to take a break. Go ahead and take 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, my test is So, let's finish early. you got plenty of time. You know, I have, I'm sure Renee has, we've got a couple of calculators. Okay. If not, you've got time to pick one up. Okay. Basic thing. Um, 
And remember, you use the calculators for my math, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Couple things just to finish up. I should finish up the next few minutes with coronary artery bypass graph. That's for multivessel disease. Why do I bring this out? You could see questions, test, um, in quotes as well. Okay, post-op. So we're just looking at the post-op. Very important to make sure, as I always said, are you in there? Um, you may say, well, what do you, how do you know? Well, I have them stick their tongue out, see if they can squeeze my hands, even if it's just a little, and move their feet. That tells me blood is flowing from a brain to the feet. Okay, so mem status. Now, it's very, very important, obviously, if somebody's gone in there and opened your chest, to make sure these chest tubes remain patent. It's just like any tube. Something I always say to the, the student. Well, someone said, "Do they mean you're going to get out?" Well, is it paper? You know, have you looked beyond to see? Is it you know any tube should be paper? Why? Because you want to look for any kinks. If you've got clots or anything in there, you need to just kind of uh, rub them, milk them. We call them milk. You don't strip anymore, but milk them and try to get any clots out. Why is that so important? One, you do not keep that chest too patent. In this patient, that can result in cardiac tamponade. In other words, the blood stays here. So that is a major serious issue. So this is critical. These tubes remain patent, as any tube should. But in this case, it can result in cardiac tamponade, and they could die. All because chest tubes aren't paid. Okay, so that's critical nursing function. Okay, um, and uh, I'll go over this again tomorrow. Um, We'll finish up with cardiomyopathy and just a little bit on VSD. Okay. I have moved DIC is going with shock because that's where it belongs. Okay. <coughs> this is called, you remember what did I talk about as far as ventricular asynchrony, right? So that affects perfusion. And that can also cause major dysrhythmias like the tag. Um, even most of them are VTAC, but you know, even S, you could have SVT, but most of those patients end up with <coughs> runs of VTAC and their meds are not working. Okay? So, what do we do? We're going to put in that's called an internal cardio defibrillator. So they've got their own little defibrillator in their chest. This tool can defibrillate and it can pace. So if you see that ICD is an internal cardio defibrillator. A lot of our patients that have had a large MIs have ventricular asynchrony. Perfusion is yucky. They're having now uh, runs of VTAC uh, because their ventricles do not work effectively. If their medications do not work, such as amiodarone, then they'll end up putting in an internal cardio defibrillator. And it will actually shock them if they go into that rhythm. It can also pace. Why? Because obviously if something's shocking the patient, it could cause them to drop the their heart rate or go asystole. Okay? My point with this is when you have a patient with a pacer, okay, whether it's just a pacemaker or an ICD, okay, it is extremely important that you educate your patient to check their pulse daily. That pacer is set at a certain rate, okay? 
So if their pacer is set at 60 and they're uh, identifying their heart rate as 50, we got a little problem. Okay, or let's say the pacer set at, let's just say it's set at 80 and their heart rate is staying 100, 110. Obviously, the pacer is not going to kick in. It's not going to work. So it's very, very important that they assess their pulse daily, especially because they're on meds, you know. And we want to make sure, and that's up to the physician as far as making sure that the rates stay in an appropriate range that if the pacer is needed, that it kicks in. Okay, so if they're too high, they'll increase their meds. If they're too low, they'll probably decrease their meds to keep them in balance, okay? So that's very important, making sure that they check their pulse daily. Most of them are given handouts, little things to keep with them about what their pacers are set at so that they know. Okay, most of them initially, just FYI, they feel that shock. Over time, that the patients tell me it gets less and less. If we're in a critical situation, I need to defibrillate, I can take that round maggot, mag maggot, maggot, <laughs> magnet, and cut it off if I need to. Okay? You'll see patients with pacemakers and ICDs out on the floors. Okay? Duh correct or my car. Okay. Okay, so now you've got time to take one.